One of my favorite of all of the Chronicles of Narnia is the book The Horse and His Boy. I must have read this a dozen times or heard an audio recording as we did family road trips around the country. But it was a couple of years ago that I was reading it again, and God kind of snuck up on me through it. And it was through this passage. Those of you who are maybe unfamiliar, it's a story of a boy who actually was kidnapped from uh, Narnia, from Arkenland, and he's grown up without knowing who his real family is. He's grown up in the South in a pagan country, and with the help of a talking horse, he has escaped, and they've made it north into Narnia. But then he gets separated from his companions, and he gets lost in the mountains late at night, and he's on a an uncooperative horse, and he's in a fog bank, and then something begins to walk up next to him. The thing, unless it was a person, went on beside him so very quietly that Shasta began to hope he had only imagined it. But just as he was becoming quite sure of it, there suddenly came a deep, rich sigh out of the darkness beside him. That couldn't be imagination. Anyway, he had felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. Now, if the horse had been any good, or if he had known how to get any good out of the horse, he would have risked everything on a breakaway and a wild gallop. But he knew he couldn't make that horse gallop. So he went on at a walking pace, and the unseen companion walked and breathed beside him. At last, Shasta could bear it no longer. Who are you? he said scarcely above a whisper, one who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are you, are you a giant? asked Shasta. Mm, you might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I am not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all. Oh, please, please go away. What harm have I ever done you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that is not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. And it was that moment in the story that just stopped me tell me your sorrows. And it opened up this whole new level of conversation between me and Jesus. Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tar Podcast. John Eldridge in the studio for a couple weeks here with my wife Stace, with Alan, and with Morgan on our team, because what we wanted to talk to you about here in January was opening up some new ways of experiencing God. And as I thought about that topic, I remembered this experience of reading this and feeling the invitation here out of a children's story. Suddenly, Jesus was right there with me, and I felt his invitation to tell him my sorrows. And it it opened up this really beautiful conversation and, and intimacy that I hadn't been looking for, kind of came in as a surprise and from an unlooked source. And what we want to just chat about this week and next is opening up some new avenues of experiencing God or experiencing God in new ways to you. And so, gang, as I raise that topic, as I raise that idea, um, where do your thoughts go with that? John, thanks for that. My thoughts immediately go to the other side. God wants that for us. He wants us to experience Him in new ways. And One who has waited long. One who has waited long. And so I think the first thing is rest assured, dear ones, that this desire to experience Him in new ways, to walk in a deeper intimacy with Him, is, is one that's an echo in our hearts, the source of which is from heaven is from our Father mm-hmm. who wants that for us. Mm-hmm. And so so what's fun is, is a beginning place is simply to ask for it. Mm-hmm. Give me the eyes to see. God is talking and inviting 
all the time. And so for us simply to ask, give me the ears to hear you. What do you want to say to me today? Mm-hmm. Such a good beginning. In writing All Things New, and I think many of our listeners were able to hear some of the podcasts on that, and hopefully you've gotten a copy and filled your hearts with a absolutely breathtaking hope. But one of the things that I write about and tell about in that book is some remarkable visions and pictures that I've had of the kingdom of God. And I was never a picture guy. I was, I was never really a vision guy. I, I hear from God fairly well, but I, I just, you know, I would be in other prayer situations or meetings or different things, and people, Craig used to get pictures, mm-hmm. you know? And, and finally, I realized one day, I was literally driving in my Ford truck, and I driving down the highway, and I realized the reason that I don't get pictures is because I've never asked. So to your point, Stace, like I just began Started to ask. And I just began to ask and say, Jesus, open up my heart, open up my faculties, open yes. up my imagination. Mm. I want to see your kingdom. Yes. Now, this isn't this isn't a podcast about seeing the kingdom of God, but that would be an example of asking. Yes. And and realizing that maybe the reason that I hadn't entered into that realm of experience was because frankly, I'd been kind of closed off to it. Yes. If truth be told. Oh, John, I love when you read from The Horse and His Boy that first word that Shasta spoke to the breath of who are you. And it's that, Stacey, you're talking about it's a curiosity, right? <laughs> Tozer said curiosity is the sign of, of an alive soul. And so I, I'm struck by how often it's my choosing to be curious about the more that I don't know. And often it's out of a pain. Often it's out of a a problem, but it's actually a doorway of curiosity into the more. I know one mentor said that the soul is infinite and its infinite need can only be matched by God's infinite capacity and desire to fill that need. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just reminded as you share this morning that our soul is infinite and vast and God is infinite and vast. And so it begins with this belief that there is more Mm -hmm. that I'm not aware of. And those are treasures that will be essential if I want to mature into the depths. Yes. Do you remember years ago, I was uh, teaching a college class of very dedicated Christian college leaders, and I played the U2 song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, and then I looked at all of them and said, is it possible to be a Christian and still not have found what you're looking for? There's dead, dead, <laughs> dead silence in the room, because like, what's the right there. answer, right? right. And, and, and I said, it better be. It better be, because there is no way You have experienced all that there is of God or of his gifts or of the kingdom or of the intimacy, the beauty, the treasures, Mm. all of it. Like our limited experience sure better not be Mm. all there is, right? And it's a very hopeful thought. Mm. Well, what's beautiful about that passage you started on is the boy starts in a fog, right? Like there's fog all around him. And that so often describes our life. Like we see partially, Mm -hmm. we see a little, but there's so much that's vague and we don't know and we don't see. And the best way for the fog to lift isn't isn't for us to try to define what we want or how life on our terms should look, but I think it's to try to see God in new ways, hear his voice in new ways, because when we do that, that's when we start to see our lives in new ways. Like Mm. that's the beginning of seeing clearly through the fog is seeing God, not trying to see our circumstances more clearly. So so what I want to hear from you today, and we'll let it bleed over into next week, let's tell some stories out of our own experience of, I wanted to experience God in a new way or in this way, or I heard people talking about such and such, and that was different for me. And I, I got curious about that. Like, how in your life have doors opened up? How have you chased them? To experience God in new ways. I remember hearing for the first time, it was about the same time that Sacred Romance came out, So, but a little before, so around 97, and I began to hear about a woman who was doing little small retreats in her home, little intimate gatherings, and teaching about an intimate relationship with Jesus, teaching about 
the fact that Jesus likes it when we worship him, that we can minister to the heart of God. And the people that were coming out of this had like their eyes opened wide. I could see a passion for Jesus in them. And she prayed for them at the end and she would get pictures. Okay. Oh my gosh. I started hearing about her everywhere I went. It was getting crazy because I was so hungry for a deeper intimacy with Jesus. I, I didn't know what was available. All I knew was that what I had wasn't enough. Mm. And I began asking people, well, who? what is her name? How do I get in touch with her? And I finally found out what street she lived on. And I literally was ready to go knocking door to door to, there's not that many houses on this street. <laughs> but I was really ravenous. I needed more of Jesus. I needed to know him more intimately and personally and encounter his love. And the day I was set out to go knocking door to door, somebody called with her number And I pushed myself into a little day retreat that was happening later that week. And it was an invitation to to knowing Jesus' love for me personally that forever changed the trajectory of my life. And and that for you, a lot of it was the new worship experience. It it was the new, it it was learning that I could sit in the presence of God with just, for me, ushered into his presence by some anointed worship, and in my imagination, my sanctified imagination, imagining myself before Him and and Him coming and just encountering a personal revelation of His love being available in the moment. It was more than manna. Okay, so now there's some important things about this 1997 story yeah. thing. First off, she's no longer here. She's with the Lord. So yes. the point is not, I need to write Stacy and get the name of this woman and go. Right, no, right. No, the point is, that was a little outside our box. It was massively yeah. outside our box. I never, you know, what do you mean she prays for you and gets a picture? Like, what? What do you mean people, like, Worship together, or worship alone for, for a long time. Like, not you know, we had a we, <laughs> we had a rich Christian life. Yes, but that was way outside our particular experience. Right, and you took the risk of going into something new, and you discovered something that's become absolutely precious to your life with God. Yes, more stories. John, it's funny that you refer to that class and that U two song. I was one of the students, right, and. Uh, to say my hair was blown back on every category is an understatement. And I came in there passionate about God. I fully given my life to God in the degree that I knew how. And week by week, my categories were just unearthed. But and what I so appreciate, we're really talking about the frontier of the soul. And something in my spirit said, yes, there must be more. Stacy. like you're talking about, yes. we called her hard line because it felt like she just had a hard line to heaven, right? Sherry would come back from these gatherings going, that was weird, it was wacky, but something was good in it. And so, for example, we're in that classroom and you presented the case for spiritual warfare and you're quoting scriptures of Second Peter and Colossians and my spirit says this is true, but my mind is going, I've never heard of this. I became a believer largely through a Presbyterian fellowship, grew up in Catholicism, and these were new categories. And so now I'm ruined and I have to deal with, do I want this? It's back to this question, who are you, right? Mm-hmm. And and so then the next week came and I felt so vulnerable because you are now on thin ice because you don't even know what you don't know. And I felt like the spirit was... I wouldn't have said this at the time, but looking back, I realized the Spirit of God was leading me to inquire and skip class the next week and go out to Rocky Mountain National Park. And so I was excited and nervous and messed up and wanting to know more of God's kingdom. So I took my Bible and I went up a trailhead in the afternoon. There was still late, uh, you know, kind of the early snows. And so it was cold up there. And I just said, God, I want to know you for who you are, not as I have learned you to be. And so I opened the gospel of Mark and I said, Jesus, whatever I encounter of you in this gospel, 
I'm going to accept. I'm going to set down my presuppositions and I'm going to see you afresh. And spirit, would you show me afresh because of what John opened up in class last week? Mm -hmm. I need to know if it's true or if he's crazy. But I sat and I read the whole gospel of Mark and I had never actually read the whole book in one setting. Just asking the question, who is the Jesus that's presented in this gospel? And I was blown away because it was way more extreme than what you presented. <laughs> and you're the most extreme person I knew. Yeah. But I was like, wait a second, John understated this. And so to your point, it opened up a new category that caused me to, in humility, say, God, I want to know you beyond who I have allowed you to be. And so, gang, as we go along, we're going to continue to share some stories and point out some observations. And one that I want to make right now is we've just named three. We named personal worship and entering into really great music that really brings you into the presence of God and spending some time there. Not one song on the radio as you're dashing to the market, but literally in your space or in your car or on your headphones or wherever it can be, extended times of really, really good worship music bringing you into a richer experience of God. So if that's new, there's one. Morgan was naming spiritual warfare as like, wait, what? My whole life I've never heard of this. Yes. Like, what's that? And how? if that is something that is either new to you or frankly you've kind of avoided, <laughs> maybe that's an open door. You know, Maybe that's a, a frontier. Maybe that's an area that God wants you to grow in. I was giving the example of writing all things new and, and saying I've, I was never a picture guy, never got pictures. And, and I can circle back to some of those stories in a minute, but just opening myself up to that. That's a third. And we're only a few minutes into this podcast. Like there, there are these rich, rich possibilities of new spaces with God for each one of our listeners. Yeah. Well, and here's a fourth. The fourth for me, different story was the discovery of presence. And if I go back to that point, like in Christmas life, presents, <laughs> birthday presents, presents. Oh, the presence presents of God. Of God. Yes. That's my Texas past accent. But what happened was I can remember vividly this period where I was the boy in the fog. Mm-hmm. And I my desire was simply not for more of God in the sense of his presence or relationship. It was, I just want things to go easier. I want things to be more efficient. And to that degree, I want some answers from God. So God whatever it takes for my life to be easier and to have more efficiency, give me those scripture verses, give me those answers, and great, and then I'll be good again. And where God really disrupted me, John, was your book, Walking with God. It was right when that galley came out, the the advanced copy of the book. I wasn't working at Ransomed Heart then. I was in another publishing industry, and I got a copy of that book. And Kelly and I had a beach trip scheduled. And I vividly remember we would sit on the shore and exchange the book to each read a chapter to each other. And it was a disruptive awakening to, wait a minute, this is I can, like we can not actually just ask questions, but we can hear God's voice. And it's not lifting up prayers, but it becomes relational and it becomes an adventure and it it actually is not about so much getting the answers as much as God's being with us and us understanding this journey of life with God. Mm. And so that's when the fog for me started to lift. And it was not out of the the purest motive. I mean, my questions to God were more, just come through, just give me relief. Fix this. Fix it. And then I'm good. And through the book, Walking with God, just it was that first taste of Oh, there's so much more here. There's so there's mm. such a bigger story than simply relief or having things fixed. Mm. It's intimacy mm. and the presence of God. Okay, can we can we point out the theme of disruption here that God will not waste your pain. He he will use the frustration. He will use the come on God, just fix this or just answer this or where are you? He's in that. He may not have caused it, but he'll sure use it. He'll use the disruption 
to bring us into new places. I'm thinking of Jesus with the rich young ruler. It's like, wow, that's really good. Well done. You've kept the commandments. That's really, that's impressive. And Jesus kind of turns and then turns back and says, oh, just one other thing. Sell everything you have and follow me. It is so disruptive. The invitation is often disruptive. And so God may be knocking through the very circumstances right now that you're just asking him to take away or mm-hmm. fix or deliver you from. It could be that those very things, that's sure been our case. Mm-hmm. I, I think most of our spiritual growth has come out of, we, we need this. Right. It's come out of being dissatisfied with the current relationship and a hunger mm-hmm. to know him more deeply. I mean, that's that's something to pray for, even if you're, if you're great. I'm great with God. This is this is good. And which is yeah, yeah, wonderful. And it's great to pray, awaken mm-hmm. and deepen my hunger because that propels us to press into more of his heart and more is available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And don't you think it's also this expression of the reality of we've chosen a life where it's impossible if God doesn't show up. We've consented to a supernatural life. And I know, John, to your point about the discomfort last year, there's just a lot of people who bring their crisis to us because they have tasted God through ransomed heart. Yeah, it's wonderful. Right? And yet, what happens in that, out of a good heart, in our brokenness, we can start to carry people. And one of the new dimensions of knowing God that you brought to me last year, which was profound and now has been profound in shaping my family, is just this daily act of, God, we give everyone and everything to you. And it sounds very simple, but it's actually very deep spirituality because by giving everyone and everything to God, it's given me a deeper place of union that I can both discern which battles are mine and also engage in a true love for a person and then release them to God and not carry them. And so it's just another example of the pain of people's crises have led to this actually vibrant place of I'm good because I am practicing a discipline of I give everyone and everything to God. Well, and it wasn't just their pain. It was yours. Absolutely. You were carrying it. Yes. And you felt a responsibility to carry it out of your good heart, trying to come through, right? Yeah. And it was that that drove you to, this is unsustainable. Completely unsustainable. I'm drying up. I'm burning out. I'm angry. I'm resentful. I need an answer to this. Yes. And God was in that. He totally was. Right? And so again, just God will do several things I want to point out in inviting us into deeper places with him or just more or just something new. One, he will draw away. Mm. He will he will draw near and then he'll draw away. And he actually does this throughout your entire Christian life. It's been my experience so far. It in the drawing away, our first reaction is, what? Where did you go? Wait, that was so rich last week or last month, or my gosh, we just got back from this couple's retreat and it was so good. And where are you? You, Okay, you're not blowing it. He's not abandoned you, but he will draw away to get you to chase him. He will. Okay. The other thing he'll do is that the old tools stop working. The old tools stop working. Okay, so you know the the expression, give a boy a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. You know, this is human nature. When you find something that works, someone took you through a discipleship program, and it was scripture memory. And for several years, scripture memory was the most rich and phenomenal way of connecting with God, and it was strengthening your soul, and that kind of dried up. And and it's not that God isn't in that anymore. He's saying there are more tools than just that particular hammer. Or you went to counseling, and and it was counseling, and counseling was the breakthrough, and counseling did remarkable things in your lives. And then then it kind of got stale, and you you sort of, you and your counsel kind of looked at each other and went, well, I, I think we're done, you know? And you're like, gosh, what? Okay, God's saying that was very helpful, but don't make that your only tool. I'm going to invite you into new places, 
by making some of the old tools less effective than they once were. Have you experienced that in your life? Have you seen those oh. two things, the draw away? The yeah, John, an example comes to mind of, so I had what I thought was a vibrant relationship with God. And in the early days, what I what I came into was this knowing of the Father. And I teach on that in Sonship, and you can hear on that resource. And so I realized, oh, God is this Trinity, and so there's a Father. And it was a, a 10 years, really, of getting to know Him and Jesus. And But this whole, like, the Holy Spirit one was always wacky, wacky. Like, it always, when you hear Holy Spirit, most of the time, that equals wacky. And at the, it, to your point, it was like, you know what? It, at that time, it was like, I'm good. I'm good. I have a vibrant relationship as a son, learning presence, as you said, Alan. And I know Jesus as a brother and a savior and even his authority. But as I was growing, I could feel the ceiling. And I was frustrated because I didn't want wacky. I actually don't want a prayer language. I actually don't want to speak in tongues. And I don't want to have this wildness of, of mystery. And I, I'm good without that. But my Christian life got to a point where there was a limit. And so I just kind of said, Uncle, God, I trust you. I'm going to pursue you. So I went knocking and I found the person, a man who I trusted, who I also saw demonstrated an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I remember that day we were on a camping trip and I went up to him and I said, hey, you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and I don't. And it weirds me out, but I want some of that. What do I need to know? I felt like six years old again. Don't you? He puts his head back. I'll never forget this moment. And he just laughs and he keeps laughing. And I'm just like, see what I mean? <laughs> and then he just looks me in the eye and he has tears. Mm. And those tears were, I have a treasure and I'm glad you asked. Mm. And he just grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, buckle your seatbelt. Mm. Wow. And so it begins. I have some fantastic stories, and the point is it matured, and my relationship with the Holy Spirit isn't wacky. It's wild, and it's personal, and it's it's inexplainable sometimes to others, but it is helping me mature in the kingdom, and it's not wacky. It's just quite mysterious. Okay, this is a big, big pause here again. I just have to keep hitting these highlights. So, you, gang, you understand, listeners— that the enemy's technique is to take these treasures of the kingdom and then show you some wacky version or unappealing version. Oh, gosh, that, that person is just so rigid in their thing on the spiritual disciplines. I don't even like being around them. He, he'll try and sour it yes. to keep you away mm. from the very treasure, right? And, and the wacky taffy stuff, that can often go around the Holy Spirit is one of his ways of keeping people away from something we desperately need. Yes, essential. God is a Trinity. So here's, a, here's another frontier to name. Who in the Trinity do you not have a rich relationship with, listeners? Right? If you're like super tight with the Father, but don't have a lot of intimacy with Jesus, then I bet God's probably going to take you into relationship with Jesus. Or are you like really tight with the gifts of the Spirit and, and the presence of the Spirit, but you don't know the Father very well. You don't feel like a daughter. You don't feel like a son. Well, there's your frontier. God, That's another fun way mm -hmm. of getting at some frontier is going, oh, wow, right, God is Trinity. And I actually don't think I even relate to him as Trinity. I just call him God, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. But there is a Father. And he relates to you like a father does. And there is a son. He relates to you like the son does. And there is the spirit. And the Holy Spirit relates to you the way that they want to. You know? So I just think that's a fun, mm -hmm. that's a fun observation of, uh-oh. <laughs> well, there's also a good heart test there where we have three teenagers in our house. And oftentimes when I'll invite them into something as a dad, their first response is, I'm good. I'm good. Meaning, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> Don't want like, to go there. I, I, I'm, pr I'm pretty content to sit where I'm at in whatever level I'm at at this thing. And I think one of the biggest invitations from God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, is do you want to go into those deeper waters? Like if you're good in the shallow water, if you're good in the baby pool, 
God will let you sit in that knee-deep water, and you really don't need much of God, and you really won't see many miraculous things because you're not putting yourself, Morgan, like you said, in a position Mm. to need God to come through, to need a miracle. And so part of these new places with God, I found, is just this hunger of, I want to keep my awe in you, God. And it shifts it from, what do I get out of it, to what is God inviting me into beyond me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of the best stories you can step into are the ones where you're not the hero, but where you're a big part of it. Like, I love the title of the book you started us with, John, The Horse and His Boy. Like, the folk, it's a disruptive title. It is. Because it should be The Boy and His Horse. Right. So already, it's a a wink, I think, from C.S. Lewis and from God. Of It's not all about you, but what can you step into in awe with God in those deeper waters? So, gang, we're just going to pause here because I bet there's already enough disruption going on with you. It's either your frustration or it's your pain or something someone said today in the podcast that's pricked you enough to go, okay, stay with that. Stay with that. We're going to be back next week. We're going to pick up part two in the spirit of if you want to go some new places with God, here's what we would suggest. But this is enough for today. I bet there's enough that's already kind of stirring, whether it's relating to the Trinity or it's worship, warfare, hearing the voice of God, visions, pictures of the kingdom, you know, your shallow water, whatever it is, the tool, the hammer (laughs) that you've been using and now your tools aren't working so well anymore. God's in it and he's inviting us all into something new and deeper and fresh. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with Alan Arnold, Morgan Snyder, Stacy, and John Eldridge.